what is the deal with sex and relationships and why they seem so complicated and half of them end in divorce. Everyone was like, my sex was amazing last night. I was like, what did that mean? Were you swinging from the rafters? Were you like, what? Were you having 16 orgasms? And I always wanted to know, so I thought, everybody wants to talk about sex, but everybody has questions. How do you stay with someone long-term and have great sex? How do you know what you want? No one was talking about women's masturbation or women's orgasm at all. People don't have to live in a monogamous life. It's not just people who are horny or people who are sex addicts. Some people are. This is actually really humbling. I don't think I've ever talked about this, but my mom flew out from San Francisco. She was trying to do an intervention because she walked in my apartment. <laughs> she thought I was insane and I was a little bit insane. I know you worked with Barbara Boxer and Pelosi and, and, uh, and Willie Brown. What did you glean from your time in politics that kind of informed your path later? Well, I remember, it's funny, I remember seeing Barbara Boxer speak. So I, I drove to I drove to San Francisco when I graduated from Michigan. And Barbara Boxer was running for Senate. It was her first campaign for Senate. And I remember I was an intern, so I went in to her first event and I saw her speak. And she got up there and spoke about politics and rights and America. And I had never heard a, a political speech like that. And I remember tears came to my eyes. I was just going, I was like 21 years old, like, wow, this is a powerful woman and she, she's speaking to my soul and there's so much change and we can do it. And I got very rally and so excited about the, the cause and the movement for people's rights and for all income families and, and diversity and fair pay for, you know, women's rights and women's, all the things. I got very motivated. And so I was really into the policy part of it and just I really enjoyed going around and speaking to different groups about voting. I mean, I was an intern at the time, but I was very, like, driven. So I was very, like, I showed up every day. But this is what I found. If you're an intern, this is a great message. If interns are listening, like, you be make yourself indispensable, indisposable, indispensable, I guess. And you just, I showed up. I would do anything. Like, I will clean the tables. I will sweep the office. And I will call people for money. Like, I'm like we're calling from the Barbara Boxer campaign. So I did everything. And it was a thrill. Also, working in politics is thrilling. There's a campaign. There's a deadline. Like, my adrenaline junkie me loved that we were all working towards this goal. And I really got to learn San Francisco. So we would drive to different parts of the city and knock on doors and ask what you do the um, get-out-the-vote efforts. And so I loved that part of it. And then I got offered a job. So then there was a bunch of things that happened. They wanted me to move to D.C. to work for her D.C., but I had just gotten to San Francisco and I wasn't ready to go. And then I got a job working for another woman in San Francisco who was the first openly gay member of the Board of Supervisors. I ran her campaign. And then Willie Brown was the first black mayor of San Francisco. He was a legend in San Francisco. I mean, he had been in, this, in the state house for 32 years as a speaker. And, and I got a call from his campaign, like, do you want to work on the Willie Brown campaign? It was a, and San Francisco is a very small town. It's sort of like a small nation in itself. It's less than a million people. If you work in politics, you know everybody. Um, and it was a, it was like you could really make change. And it, it was just a, a small a, a smaller group of people. You could have a big impact. And so I guess what I learned is like I learned about connection and communication. I learned about being able to talk to anybody about anything. And I think it even I'm not I can really I love connection. Like my favorite thing and people still laugh at this is to walk into a room where I don't know anybody. And I've constantly put myself in situations throughout my life where I'm like, I'll go to this place where I don't know anybody. Even in high school, my brother went to one high school and I chose the other one at first, but that didn't, whatever. Like, I just always want to do what people aren't doing. So I, with Willie Brown, like, I loved being able to talk to groups of people about why they should vote for him. Anyway, I, lo I loved the ability to get people to think differently about things without judgment. Because I'm so, I'm not like an angry person. How I get in my stress, I'm not like a um, divisive person. I don't enjoy argument or conflict. I'm also conflict avoidant. But I think I know how to meet somebody and how to hear them out and listen. I learned how to listen. I learned how to, to, to make change. But then I, so I did that for, I was in politics for 10 years. And there was a bunch of other things. I could talk about it forever. What I did, what I, did I, I find it really interesting. And it was very pivotal in my growth. But I, I also sort of towards the end of it became sort of disillusioned with politics because so much of it was about raising money. And then you see like everything, the shadow side is like these candidates have to get up every day and they have to like kiss babies and shake hands and raise money. 
And I kept getting pushed towards that part of it. Like, can we get this donor and this thing? And they get appointed a certain commission. So just kind of like everything that we know about politics. And I just thought this isn't, this isn't filling my soul anymore. This isn't doing what mm -hmm. I thought it would, what it would do, make me happy, which we know nothing's going to make me happy unless it comes from the side. But at the time I was like, I'm not interested in this anymore. But I learned how to communicate, how to make change, how to be bold, how to be aggressive, how to get how to get anything done. I think I really learned that anything is possible because Willie Brown was such a, a mentor. They all these people were. If you become a politician, you have such a work ethic and you also know how to get things done. Maybe you're a little manipulative. Maybe you're a little like you just everything's possible. The rules don't apply to you. You can walk on water. And I, working for people like this, this other woman I work for, like, there was, you can't take no for an answer. So everything's possible. And I learned to pull off amazing feats working for these people. Like, things that I were impossible. I would, like, Willie Brown, is this interesting? Like, I have not Yeah, I'm curious, what's an example of an amazing feat you pulled off? So Willie Brown was bad elected mayor. And so he won. It was exciting. And he said... There was like 50 of us on the campaign, and he took 10 of us to City Hall. He said, I want 10 of you to be on the transition team. And I was like 25 at the time. And he said, I want to do an inaugural ball for the entire city of San Francisco, and I want everybody to be invited, but we don't have a budget. And I was kidding. Okay. So I went around to every single food service restaurant vendor in San Francisco. We got the entire port of San Francisco, port. I remember what it was. One of the ports. I lived there for 20 years, but I can't think. Like, Pier, the Pier. Pier something donated their whole space. And I went around and I spent like six weeks getting all the food donated, all the singer. All, I, I, I basically coordinated this entire event, the inaugural ball, that everybody in San Francisco was welcome and invited to come to an event. And there was no cost. And that was stressful and intense and amazing. I remember big trucks rolling in and my mom was, she came to, I think I was talking to my, no, maybe there was no cell phones, but I don't, maybe she was visiting me because there was no cell phone, but she watched me like, and these U-Haul trucks coming in like this way, you know, I'm like a five foot one, like tight, like I come in. and I just coordinated this entire event to happen. But there were several things like that, that I, I would just, I did events for him where people would show up. It was like 300 people. I think Maya Angelou spoke, she did speak, but it was like raised. $30,000 for him, but I had no, like I got everything donated for him. So that kind of stuff that I wouldn't have known how to do, I just. Did he have full confidence that this could actually happen? Or was he like testing you to see if you could actually make it happen? I don't, I'm trying to remember. Like, and it wasn't just me, but I was in charge of the inaugural committee. So yes, he, we had people, but no, I, I think that he was just like, yeah, anything's possible. That's why he's so successful. Because these right. people are like, everything is possible. I don't want the citizens of San Francisco who live in the Bayview, who live in these areas that can't afford tickets to be left out of this momentous occasion. And I think that if maybe looking back, if I like these people need money, and I'm sure we end up paying for some things like cost of whatever, but we really got people to donate because remember, they also got to be part of this exciting moment and they got to put their, they had a booth with their signage and. So, but I think that he believed that people, he could make anything happen. And I then believed that anything could happen. And then maybe I always had that mindset. And I don't know where that comes from. And that's interesting because I moved to San Francisco with nothing, no money. I had, a, I packed up my geoprism and drove cross country in three days and I had nothing. And I lived with a friend and well, it's job. So I think I have that mentality too, that anything could happen. And how did you link up with Kelly? Kelly Dwayne, and how did this idea of doing a documentary come about? Okay, so that's my next chapter is that, so with politics happen, all the stuff, I, I thought, this is no longer, I was exhausted, I was burnt out. And I thought, I really want to do something that I can, like, I felt like I was sort of a, essentially a producer. I was essentially like a, um, making stuff happen for all these people. So I had those skills. But I also, at the time, I became obsessed with documentaries. And I was watching every documentary. I loved The War Room about Bill Clinton's candidacy. And mm -hmm. there were so many great documentaries. I mean, I saw all of them, all the documentaries from, like, the big documentaries from the 70s, 80s, 90s. Mm -hmm. There was a few about politics that I was just really taken by. And I thought, 
I was driving. Oh, so back up. After the election, Willie Brown, I said, I need a break. I had a day off in four years and I bought a one-way ticket. I went backpacking for nine months in Southeast Asia. And I did my first meditation retreat, my first silent 10-day retreat in Thailand. Because I knew, you know, I was suffering too. Like my dad had died and I decided to, instead of, like I was in therapy, but I wasn't really working to myself. I just got busy. Like he died. I went back up to college three weeks later. I got six jobs, three jobs. I took three classes, got two jobs. And I was just working. I, I decided to numb the pain by filling it with work and drive and not slowing down. And I was exhausted. So I went on this trip to kind of find myself. It's like eat, pray, love. I did all those things. And then I came back and I was like, I really want to create something that is meaningful that I can create that could like, I could, I remember saying this at the time I didn't have better words for it was like, Something that I can like point to and be like, I agree, this is something that I've made. Like, it's not just helping other people with their missions. I didn't know what it was, but I, then I came up with the idea for a, a documentary because Willie Brown, so, so I came back from Asia and he's like, hey, because I have a very good relationship with him. He's like, you're back. I'm going to China. Will you lead a trade mission to China for me? We're going to China, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And I was like, Sure. So then I'm like the expert on China. So then it was ironic. I went back and then for two years, I had a job being an international consultant. I started a business, essentially, where spe- spe- like the speak- Antonio Vigoroso, when he was speaker of the state legislator before he became mayor of San Francisco, and said, well, will you do one to Mexico? So for two years, I traveled around the world with po- politicians on trade missions, making these events. Like we'd go meet with like the minister, like we went to um, Buenos Aires and met with the head of of uh, uh, um, transportation in Curitiba when I went with Antonio. Like, we just went everywhere. So Willie Brown, I made this trip happen, and I traveled, and I, like, I got them to keep the wall, Great Wall of China open because we weren't going to be there in time for something. Like, that's the kind of shit I did. I'm like, it has to happen. It's Willie Brown. So anyway, I did that for two years. And then I thought, I still need to create something that's my own. I was driving over the Golden Gate Bridge one day, and I had this vision of a film about Willie Brown because he is a fascinating man. He's brilliant. I mean, I saw him work in meetings. I'd sit with like, I was also his issues director for a while. And I'd sit with him in meetings with like policy where all these people would be sitting around and he just wouldn't say a word for two hours. And then he'd come up with the most brilliant way to solve a problem. And anyway, so I loved him and I thought, or I liked his work, but I knew he's controversial. And I said, I'm going to do a film on him running for re-election. I didn't know what it was going to be. So I took a class at a film place in San Francisco called the Film Arts Foundation. And in that class, I was like, I'm already doing this film. It's his, he's launching, he's launching his re-election campaign. And so I don't know what to, what is it called when you, I need someone to shoot it. What's that person called? And they're like a director of photography or I'm like, okay, great. I need that. And I need whatever. So Kelly Dwayne was in my class with me and she's like, I'll help you make the film. And so literally my whole class, my teacher ended up shooting and Kelly was, and being my producer and that's how it happened and I went on this wild ride of making it and I raised all the money for it because I knew how to raise money and I knew all the big donors in San Francisco and it took me a long time it took me about two or three years and it was my baby it was my first baby before sex with Emily I was like I'm in it I shot 160 hours of footage and I whittled it down to an hour and I made a documentary and took it to festivals and I was on PBS and it was a it was a it was a great film. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, which is also a theme in my life we'll come back to. I never knew that we're going. So did you did you imagine that you would continue doing becoming a, a shooting did. documentaries? Yeah, because I did a film and I loved it, but it was so hard. And this is classic. I was so burnt out that by the time it came out, I was like, I'm so tired. It was so because at every stage I had to learn how to shoot. I had to learn how to edit. I had to, I mean I had an editor, but I had to learn how to market it and promote it and cut a trailer and apply to film festivals. I applied to 160 film festivals. I had to take the VHS tape to the post office. And I got, I still have the letter. I have 100 rejection letters. You know, I got open to three festivals, but I got into good ones, but whatever. It was a whole thing. But I was exhausted. And I was like, okay, you know what I like? This leads me to current day. I loved interviewing people, which is funny because now it's like harder for me to interview. Like that's whatever. But I love telling people stories and I love the interview process. So I was going to do a, so I thought maybe I'll just do, um, yeah, and I was going to do another documentary, but I thought, what could I do? And I started a cable access show, a very short-lived one, because anybody can have a cable access show in any city, just so you know. You just have to take a weekend course. 
So I was going to say, I've always been like, sex and relationships was like the wild card in my life. I always dated, but I didn't really want to commit. And I've never thought of myself as a monogamous person. And I thought, what is the deal with sex and relationships? And why they seem so complicated and half of them end in divorce. And by the way, the sex I'm having is okay, not great. I'm also an overachiever. But everyone was like, my sex was amazing last night. I was like, what does that mean? So I was always asking people, when you say you had amazing sex, back up. Like, what did that mean? Like, we was his penis double jointed? Were you swinging from the rafters? Were you like, what? Were you having 16 orgasms? And I always wanted to know. So I thought, I'm going to do a show about sex in San Francisco. So I... I had an intern for my film and we started doing this show. And then she said to me, you should do, she was, you know what? Maybe you should try a podcast. I'm like, what the hell's a podcast? It was 2005. She was, well, it's only audio and you just need to record files and you don't need video. I'm like, thank God, because video is harder. And I'm like, let's do that. So that's where the Sex with Emily started. And I invited a bunch of friends over to my house from di in different stages of relationships and dating and love and gender orientations and sexualities. And I interviewed them all day. So like, this is where the change happened. I sat there for like five hours. I hired a sound guy off Craigslist and I just sort of talked. And I realized that the diet, the conversation that was coming out was about people being really open and real and authentic about they didn't really understand their bodies and their sexuality. They were sort of on a journey and everyone was on a different path. But, but the, the common theme, everyone was like, they didn't really know what good or great sex was. They didn't really know about relationships in the way that I needed to hear. And that I, I, we were all trying to figure it out. And I thought, there's really nowhere else to go for this information. And I sat there. It was almost like akin to what people say when they love at first sight or they fall in love or it's they knew the moment I saw it. I knew this was my path. In that moment and that day, I thought, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Because remember, I'd been on this path, like, pivoting when it didn't work. I was like, that was work. That didn't work. And I'm like, this is it. This is a dialogue and this is a conversation that's going to change people's lives because no one's talking about it. And I was so, like, I remember I want to be in, I was like, this, there's so much to learn, there's so much to unpack. And I just read every sex book on the planet and I started going deep into podcasting. And, and every week I released podcasts and I interviewed people and that's where that all started. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out. And back to the show. You invited these, these friends of yours to come to your apartment. You had a camcorder. Yep. You're going to put them on c camera. This is before funny. Instagram. It was, it was this. I still have it. It was this audio. Oh, no. This was my traveling audio player. It was a, it was a soundboard. Right. But they were going to talk about their sex lives and their ideas about sex on record for yeah. you to then do whatever you want to do with that. Yeah. And they were fine with They were fine with that. Fine with it. Because remember, and what I find out is that people are like, how are you going to get anyone to talk about sex? Everybody wants to talk about sex. Yeah. Not yeah. so so necessarily on, 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 on a podcast, but everybody has questions. Everybody is lost. Nobody had marching. No one understood it. It was like, and how do you stay with someone for a year? How do you stay with someone long term and have great sex? How do you know what you want? No one was talking about women's masturbation or women's orgasm at all. And so... People were open. They were like, yeah, I will tell you my opinions and my beliefs. Now, not everybody got into like the nitty gritty details, but people were like, here's my beliefs on it, or here's why I got divorced, or here's what I like in the bedroom. But it wasn't as specific as it's gotten over the years, but people were open. And I actually did film the first 20. And I have that tape, those tapes, but they, I never used them because I couldn't get, didn't have people, I couldn't afford, like I didn't know what to do with video at the time. Right. So I, no. people were open. How did you come across Captain Erotica? Oh, my God. I met Captain Erotica because I was really into Burning Man. So so my friend Mark would go to Burning Man, and that was before I went. And he's like, you have to meet Captain Erotica because he's told us. Remember, once you get into this realm of sex and relationships, everybody comes out of the war work. And also remember, it's San Francisco where people are very open and people like mm -hmm. poison someone naked or walking down the street, someone flogging someone. Like, you're just like, okay, yeah, they're they're trans or whatever like 
Welcome to San Francisco. People are doing their thing. So he said to me, Captain Erotica was at my Burning Man camp last year. And he is somebody who works with people in open relationships. And he helps men who are um, with their wives. Like he teaches them how to be better lovers to their wives. And he teaches them how to uh, whatever. He's open. He's like Spanx. And th- I don't know. I was like, okay. So I met him because people thought he'd be a great interview. So he was one of my first interviews because he was the person I knew that was in the sex space doing being I thought that was so shocking at the time it was like it took me pretty quickly to catch up that like open relationships and people don't have to live in a monogamous life and that's okay too and that it actually does work and it's not just people who are horny or people who are sex addicts some people are but some people just like know that monogamy isn't for them and they know how to practice excellent communication and rigorous honesty and so all that so he was my first person I was like wow people do this and men let you have sex with their wives in front of them and to show them how to have sex with them in a way that's completely ethical then who knows like maybe he went off the grid and something crazy happened but at the time it was like really groundbreaking for me and also because you had been you you already shot a documentary with hundreds of hours of footage you knew how to interview people you know you knew how to bring out what was most compelling about their story and uh and so when you uploaded that and it got however many 75,000 downloads or what what have you, were you surprised when that it got such a big reaction? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. And I think I said 75,000 in New York. I don't remember how many, but it was, a, it was, remember, there was like, it was 2005. It was the first month of podcasting or the first three months. And I remember just uploading the file and being like, holy, I hope this is good, like obsessing, not worried. But then people started emailing me and saying, we like your show and it's it's really helping us. And 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 so I was really, I was like, wow, this is, I'm getting reinforced then. People want to hear this. I'm not alone. Because remember also, I was trying to find my own answers. I wasn't a doctor of human sexuality. I hadn't studied. I was just curious, really curious and wanted to help myself and others. So I was... I think that I realized that so many people were in the same boat. And so that felt really good that people were like, it helped me and thank you and had questions. So, yeah, it felt incredible. But I'm, it's so funny. Like, I wish, and this is something I'm still working on right now, is like, how do we take that in and appreciate it in the moment rather than on to the next? Oh, that's great, but I have no money. Oh, that's great, but how am I going to keep getting it out? Oh, I want like all the worries that come up. I, I wish I could have been like, wow, congratulations, Emily. That's awesome. People are really into your show. That's what just feels good. I should go out and celebrate. But I think, and I still do this, so thank you for this moment. How do we how do we um, work on receiving? Mm. I, I work on that a lot. I like. were, you, were you still meditating at that time since you did your 10-day retreat in Thailand? No. I, I, I wanted to be meditating all the time, but I, I was never able to make it a, even though then I would go back and do another 10 day because I thought that would help. But then I realized it's about integration and consistency and not just, no, I wasn't, I wasn't. So what was your, what was your spiritual or, or what, what your Release first, you you mentioned that you would burn yourself out from time to time. What was your way of releasing or managing stress? Um, My way was exercise. I know, and and you you learned masturbation at 25, so maybe that was a part of it. Yes, I masturbate a lot. For me, my release has always been athletic and working out. And I used to run marathons, and that was a that I thought that was a release for me, and like rock climb, and I would do yoga. I started doing yoga in like the late 90s. So yoga to me was a little bit more um, of that, like that felt a little bit meditation adjacent. Um, right. Well, my release was mostly like my friends and I would say it was exercise. It was, it was moving my body in whatever way. And what was your financial situation like in 2005? Did you have money saved up when you started this new podcast? I, I had some money saved up. So I did something really silly. I did not what I was doing. I had some money, not a lot. I had a job at the time. I was working for this production company in San Francisco, selling product, like trying to sell shows and come up with shows. It was kind of like something I wasn't that into, but they were paying me. 
a couple thousand dollars a month. But early on in the podcast, I had a lot of success in air quotes, meaning within the first three months, I got offered a live show on the radio for the station in San Francisco, CBS Radio, which is big. They were like, we love your podcast. Can you come do it on Saturday nights, 11 to, to 12? And it's expanded to 11 to 2. And then I got a TV company. This was like, this was like 2007. So 2005, I was still working on another job. And then I, 2006, I started doing well. I got this radio show. And then they, then I got like a book offer. And then I got a TV, a potential TV thing. And things were happening. Like I was six to, I was like, oh, well, I'm going to quit this job because it's, it's all happening. And then I took out a loan, like a business loan. And, um, and I, because I had such, I was very naive. Like I just thought, I didn't live in LA. You remember this? I, I knew no one in entertainment. I was living in San Francisco. No one was doing what I was doing. And I thought that if my lawyer called me and said, they want to syndicate your radio show for five days a week and it's an 800000 I remember him saying this to me. Like, it's a, it'll, that's an $800,000 deal. I was like, oh my God. Like, I was like, it's all happening. So I took out a loan to get me by because I had no money. And then the recession hit in 2009. You took out a $60,000 loan just before the recession hit. Yeah. And I, I, I had no money. So I ended up completely not having any money. And like my mom lent me money and. You moved in with a friend? So I, I lived in this apartment in San Francisco and I sold, I sold, I still, I sold everything I had. On, I didn't have a lot. I sold like my juicer. It was like two of the things I had that were expensive. My juicer, my curtains, my suitcase, like whatever I could sell, I sold. So I sold it all and I moved in with my friend and I sat on her couch for about nine months or she had an extra bedroom. It's not really a couch. And I rented out my place. It was very humbling. And it was like probably one of the best things that happened. I'm going to be honest. Like I, I drove my friends to the airport for 40 bucks because there was no Uber. And I was like, if you're going, like, let me drive. I was very like, what can I do? Because I was, I had this, I knew, I knew that sex with Emily, that, that, there's no way it can't be successful. I have people listening. It's helping people. And there's interest. So I'm not going to walk away from it. I'm just going to do what I need to do to get by. I got a job. And remember, I'm like older though. I, I was in. You're in your mid-30s. You're in your mid-30s. Your brother has this skyrocketing legal career. You yeah. know, I your was, other friends are probably like making well in the six figures. In everything. Yeah. And it was how my mom flew out from San Francisco and she was like, try to do an intervention because she walked in my apartment. <laughs> intervention. I had these papers up. It was like that scene from A Beautiful Mind with all my, like, well, mom, this business plan, it's all going to work. And she was like, you know, you job at Nordstrom's, like, it was a great thing. And, and Starbucks has a health plan. And I'm like, I'm not. And she thought I was insane. And I was a little bit insane. But I had you have to be insane. You have to be out of your mind. Out of my mind. I'm like, I believe in this mission. It's going to happen. It, there's too much success. There's too much interest wherever. So I didn't walk away from it. Everyone's successful. You know, yeah. Like my mom's like, I'm not, my mom paid for my health care. She's like, I'm not helping you out though. Like, which again, even though she has money and like my brother tossed me some, a little bit of money, like he's like, I'll help you, but I'm not helping you too much. Like this is not that you pay to pay my rent. Mm -hmm. But, and I, I appreciate because while my mother and my father, my brother and my brother are successful, they could have bankrolled it. They could have been like, fine. But they were like, no. And that's when I moved in with a friend and I didn't ask them for anything else because I was like, I'm going to make this work. So, oh my God. I know. And then I got a job and this was actually really good for me. And I got to say, this is inspirational, everybody. I was, I'll just say it. I was 40 and I was working for a woman since I went back to my political roots who was running for mayor and she, needed some help in her office. And this is actually really humbling. I don't think I've ever talked about this, but I went in there and I was essentially answering phones and assisting her when she needed help. And it was, the good thing about it is that it was consistency. And I went in five days a week, ten, like nine to five. And I sat there and I like did office stuff. And I was making, I remember, I remember getting the paycheck. It was like, Maybe it was like 400 a week or 500 a week. But after a month, I had $2,000. And then I had 3000 You know, I was like, I started building a bank account again from the way of like me being 
responsible. And I actually liked having this job because it wasn't stressful. It was a little humbling, but I had my, my I was obsessed and churning on sex with Emily and what I could do. So in that period, I was still doing sex with Emily after work. I'd go and record it with, at the studio with my friend who had worked at CBS still, like Menace, who was on my show and he helped me. But I, I it wasn't my all consuming. I had another responsibility. I got, I took the attention off of it. I wasn't trying so hard. And in that year period where I had this other job and I was trying, I'd moved back into my place. This is when I started to get products. You mentioned a, you mentioned a sex toy that you had liked on your yeah, podcast. Yeah, you really have done your research. So I, I got sex toys sent to me from this company called Jeju. And they make this toy called the Mimi, which honestly is still one of my favorite toys. And I, t I was like, couldn't believe I got a free sex toy. And then I, or they, I got a box of them, but I liked this one the best. And I talked about it on my show and they called and said, our sales went up by 40%. Me talking about it on my podcast in like 2010 or 11. And then, or 10. And I was like, wow, okay, well, let's do something. Pay me and I'll give you a YouTube video. I'll give you a tweet because um, I had Twitter and YouTube and I had, there was no Instagram the time and then I just started then I got and then I got started being business I started talking to brands I went to sex conventions and then I just started hustling for sponsorships and figuring out how to make a living thank you so much for watching just FYI we post a new video almost every day so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything and if you enjoyed this video I think you're really gonna love this one as well and if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.